Big Mike here with Hayes Entertainment. Today's episode, we got the best NFL fullback of all time, the NFL legend, Lorenzo Neal. He's just waiting for that Hall of Fame ballot. Like what we're doing, hit the subscribe button. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Lorenzo Neal, number 41 in your program and number one in your heart. I'm coming on the show. I only touch greatness. That's right. Don't meet me there. Beat me there. Looking for the most beers on tap? Great steaks. Great staff. Head over to the John B. Pub. We got the best beers, steaks, chicken wings, nachos in town. Come see us at the John B. Pub. The John B. Pub, the best bar in town. Come sign up for our football pool. Say hey, St. you. <laughs> Saddle the number one sports podcast in Vancouver with Ryan Hayes and Big Mike. Ryan Hayes and Big Mike. I only touch greatness podcast. Ryan Hayes and Big Mike are taking over the podcast scene in Vancouver. Get down or lay down. Only Touch Greatness podcast yeah. with Ryan Hayes and Big Mike. We are going live. Do the fish thing. I, lo- I love I love fishing. I love riding horses. Hey, Lorenzo. Hey, what's happening, brother? Can you hear me? Oh, you Not much. Yeah. How's it going? Good, good, guys. How are we doing? Good. good uh, my, name's, my name's Big Mike, and that's uh, my partner here, Ryan. Okay. Big Mike and Ryan. Got it. Hey, nice to meet thank, you. Nice thank to meet you, you guys. Much. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time for us today. We really appreciate it. We've been big oh. fans of yours for a long time. Oh, no worries, brother. Thanks for reaching out, man. Glad I could serve. That's what it's about. Yeah. Okay, Mike. Sure. Uh, well, yeah, we'll get started here. Uh, born in Cali. Um, what was life like growing up? And did you play any other sports growing up? Yeah, absolutely. California kids, they say just a little bit tougher. That's what one what of my coach Sweeney used to say when I was at Fresno State. I, I didn't think so because I played against a lot of guys from different places. I'm like, man, I don't know if we're as tough as uh, a lot of those guys from the deep south. But uh, growing up, I grew up in a small town, Lemoore, California, raised on the farm. Guys, believe it or not, had to get up every morning at 4.30, feed pigs, slop hogs, give cows, feed the calves, would get calves, have to give them a bottle. And then I would go to school. Then I'd go play football or go to wrestling practice or go to track practice. And then I have to come home and do the same thing. I remember Friday nights, guys, I'd run for 150. I had my senior year average over 100 yards a game, average 16 tackles a game. And Friday night, have a big game. Saturday morning, my dad say, rise and shine. Those pigs don't grab any yards you ran for. Boy, get up and let's go. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I tell you, growing up, it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was fun. I had a lot of great memories. And uh, it was just a, a good town growing up. Didn't have a stoplight. Didn't have a McDonald's. We have to really look at Lamore, and now I, I go back home every now and then, and now we got three stoplights, guys, believe it or not. Now we got a McDonald's <laughs> and a Taco Bell, and we got all the rest of this stuff. But uh, it was great growing up like that because, you know what, it was you, you get up 
on a Saturday, whatever, after you get finished working, you jump on a bike, go for a bike ride with your friends. You know, we didn't uh, necessarily have the, you know, the video games like our kids have on the phones and all that different stuff. We had the arcade guys. So you did some work and dad would give you a couple bucks. You ride your bike to the arcade, you know, arcade, get, uh, arcade yeah. shop and play and hang out. So that's what it was about for me in the, you know, growing up in a small town. And then we didn't have money in the fields, guys would have rock fights, claws, get, you know, get rocks and, you know, hit chunk it in each other. We did it all, guys. We built ramps out there, and I would jump. I think I, I you know, we'd build the little ramps and get on our bikes and jump. So we did everything. You name it, we did it. So growing up in a small town, guys, it gave me, a, it created a lot of culture. It created the young, the man that I am today. So I, I wouldn't, tra I wouldn't trade it for anything. We actually, we actually have a friend in common, me and you, uh, Dante Marsh. Okay, yeah, you know yeah. Dante, huh? Yeah, I know Dante pretty well. He yeah. he played out here in Vancouver, and I I was always at the giant or at the Lions games, and big fan. He hooked me up with some memorabilia. We've had him on the show a couple times. So Dante, yeah, good guy. He's in. I think he's in Stockton right now. I, I like Dante. Yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. I I told him I was having you on. He sent me a picture of you two together. Yeah, we have to, we're you know every now so now you know what I do when retired and stuff I'll play golf I still work out guys we still got the gun so you know I'll give you guys some pitch tickets to the gun show if you want to see that but uh every now and then we'll go grab a cigar so me and Dante we hook up and, and uh, go down to the cigar lounge and maybe smoke a cigar stogie every now and then and still yeah. enjoy in, in, enjoy life but uh it's just been exciting times I'm excited to be on the show I, I think you guys know I have a son now who's you know 23 he's Lorenzo Jr. and who's uh looking to join the, you know, the NFL this year. And hopefully uh, we'll see what his future holds. So exciting, exciting times for the Neil family. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We need to get him on here too. Absolutely. Uh, He'd love to. And you and Dante, obviously in common, that was leading to my next question was uh, what was it like playing at Fresno state? Man, it, it was great. Jim Sweeney guys was unbelievable. I mean, this guy was an unbelievable coach that just gave it to you. I loved him because you know, right now, in, in the world we live in right now, he would have been arrested. Do not pass go. Uh, do not pick your check for 250 bucks. So Jim Sweeney, he's like, he was from Brood, Montana. He was an Irish Irish guy, and his father was a coal miner. And uh, this guy was just tough. I love Jim Sweeney. I sp uh, spoke at his home going, his funeral. I mean, he was like a father to me. And I remember, you know, uh, going to Fresno State and playing there, and we had a kid who was named Sonny. And Jim Sweeney would go up on a tower, and he would, you know, he'd he had, we thought it was water, but it didn't look, it smelled a little different. Might've had Bach in his water bottle and he would yell down. He, hey, Sonny, come here. You're a lion. Sonny comes over and he said, you're a lion, a thief. You lied. You told us you could play football. You're a thief because you're still in a scholarship. So, I mean, I had this <laughs> coach guys that was un friggin' believable. You come in, you late. I mean, it's not calling your mom or dad. It's not okay. You got to go run gassers. This coach Sweeney, he, I seen him gut shot guys and drop them right in the locker room. Come here, come here. And he, boom, let them have it right in the gut, in the solar pack. So I, so what was it like? It was, it was fun. It was scary because you knew you had a guy in Jim Sweeney that would kick your, you know what, if you yeah. stepped out of line. I loved Fresno State. It was awesome. And Jim Sweeney was a great man, guys. He allowed me to, to fulfill my college uh, dream because I was a two sports guy. I won the state of California in wrestling, um, state champion. And, <clears throat> and so I got to college and, and Dennis DeLito was the wrestling coach and football's first. And then, you know, we played a football game and Dennis DeLito tells me, God, I wish you could wrestle. And I'm like, Sweeney's like, they go over to coach Sweeney and Dennis and Sweeney's like, he know, I was, a, you know, thought I was a stud. So he let me wrestle a match and still play football. I'm like, dude, it was crazy trying to do both sports. I was crazy wrestling and playing uh, football. That was absolutely the dumbest thing that I ever did. But uh, I was able still to be an All-American in, in wrestling in college. I was ranked number three in the country. I placed in NCAA. So it, it, was, it was the things that I look at now and I was able to do was like pretty remarkable. I wouldn't do it again. But that experience, I wouldn't take it back for nothing, guys. So it was an unbelievable experience, though. Was uh, Dante lucky enough to have him as a coach down there, or was he uh, gone by the time Dante got there? Uh, he was gone. I think he was more with the heel, and he missed that. I think he missed Jim. I don't know if he got his leg because Jim was a uh, Jim. I, I think Dante missed Jim, but I don't. I, I'm okay. not sure. But but uh, Jim was phenomenal. Great guy. Great coach. 
Um, uh, you know, I still great. I'm in great contact with his son, Kevin Sweeney. Um, you know, it was my, actually my banker at, at Wells Fargo, but, uh, it was just, it was, it was amazing times in, in the central Valley, uh, going to Fresno state and just the stories and the memories that, that I have, um, it, it is just things that you, you reflect back when you get older and you say, what are some of those defining moments <clears throat> that made you and were the, the make the, the make you the help makes the person that you are today. And I remember my, my, my senior year, junior year, I was, I just won. I was all league player of the year. I was all Valley player of the year. I was all central section. So got all these awards and my grandma calls me over and she says, come here, son. So she brings me in here. She said, I'm going to give you a gift. And she sits me down and she has a beat up station wagon. And I'm like, oh, Lord, please don't give me that station. He said, don't worry, son. You're not getting the station. <laughs> it's OK. And you'll get, you're not getting the station wagon. And I was like, OK. And so she knew what I was going through. She knew that everyone was, hey, this is the next phenom. This guy is great. You know, we had another relative in Lemoore and they were saying, this guy's probably gonna be the next biggest thing since Tommy Smith. I remember you guys remember the 64 Olympics where the guy holds up his hand. Yeah. He's from Lemoore, California, Tommy Smith. So anyways, so all these accolades I'm getting, she sits me down and she said, son, we came from Fort Worth, Texas. Let me tell you about your family. And her and Oliver, my grandma was 97 when she died. My grandfather was 94. And they watched me play in college. They watched me play in high school. They watched me play in the pros. So I was very, very blessed. And I remember she sat me down and she said, we came from Fort Worth, Texas on the back of a truck. And my uncles and my, it was, it was five of them, but all of them wasn't. My dad had uh, six brothers, five other brothers and one sister. And one of my uncles wasn't born yet. And she talked about coming out, her and Oliver, and they came out to California and they worked in the cotton fields and picked chop cotton and pick cotton and you would weigh it. So you'd have a bag and you'd weigh your cotton and that's how you got paid. And she was a supervisor and she's sitting down telling me this story because I'm achieving a lot of things and a lot of great things are happening in my life. And she said, you know what, son? So she's telling me that story. And she said she was a supervisor over 25 people. And she said, this was great because I got another, you know, 10 cents an hour, whatever it might've been. And she said, I was pregnant with your uncle Joe, your uncle Johnny. And she said, I went to work on that Wednesday I had him that Thursday and I went back to work on Friday and I said, grandma, but why do you just not go Friday? And then Saturday and Sunday, you're already off. And then you come back on Monday. And she said, because I was all those people. And she said, I never wanted to take a vacation when the boss is around. She said, because they'll realize how much they don't need you. And she said, son. So when she told me that at that time, I really didn't know what she was saying. But that one of the statement, when I got in high school, she said, son, and got in college and got in pros. She said, OK. And what I told you, never take a vacation, never take a vacation when the boss is around. They'll realize how much they don't need you. And she kept telling me that. Think about 17 years in the NFL. Think about how many guys that I saw that was just as good as me, if not better. But they decided not to go to the meetings. They decided, you know what, I'm a little bit injured. I'm hurt. You know, I'm playing. I, I broke a finger. Or I'm playing with a sore hamstring and I don't want to play. So many guys, they take vacation when the boss is around and the team realize they don't how much they don't need them. And that was something that stuck with me at a young age. And that's a story that I always try to tell to my kids and tell to other people. You never take a vacation when the boss is around. They realize how much they don't need you. Because we at times when we're in our season, when we're on top of our game and we're on top of life, we think that it's about us. And it's really not. Life is still going to go on. You look at the great, look at all the greats, look at, you know, from Ronald Reagan, look at Martin Luther King, look at all these great people that was on this earth before us, even Christ himself, Jesus, but all, think about everyone has, everyone has a, a shelf life and the world's going to continue to go on. So never take that break. So that's what something that drove me. It was something that I hope that, you know, could help you guys or help the listeners that are listening to this is just the fact that, you know what, take advantage of this opportunity that you have a life. Don't take a vacation. Don't don't take it for granted. Live it to the fullest. That's a great quote. Great, yeah, great, no great kidding. quote. I like yeah. That. I almost got goosebumps on that one. No joke. <laughs> uh, Thanks, who did you, yeah. Who did you look up to or uh, try and mirror your game after growing up, like going through college and high school and stuff? Who was the guy? 
Yeah, believe it or not, guys, I was a huge, I was a huge Nebraska fan. Tom and Osborne, I loved old Tommy. I loved old Mike Rozier. Dude, I started doing abs really hard because remember guys, they would wear that shirt, the half shirt, and they would show the abs. <laughs> College, you could wear it to be flapping. I was like, yes, I even went with Deuce Deuce 22. So, uh, man, I just, I, 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 I enjoy it so much, guys. And then, you know, as a pro, when I was growing up, the team that I liked, believe it or not, guys, San Diego Chargers. It was crazy because there was a guy that I just fell in love with, uh, you know, Dan Fouts, Danny Fouts. I see Dan now and Dan knows I'm like a big fan of his. He's like, oh, we said, Dan, it was great watching him play the way that he'd back at pedal in the pocket. Him, you know, he just couldn't get past Dan Marino. I was just always watching that epic battle, him and the Miami Dolphins. But uh, always was a Charger fan. I loved watching Dan, Dan Marino play. Just loved his game. I loved Chuck Muncie. I used to love uh, the Chargers guys just growing up. So it was crazy that I got the – you know, live that dream and get to play for that team. So uh, it, it was so many guys that that I looked at and watched them play growing up. Um, but I think as far as role model, a person that was huge in my life was my father. Having my father and my mother in my life, my father, you know, was a, I don't believe it or not, was a man of the cloth, was a pastor. He passed away five years ago, died. And, you know, it was just, it, it was just all the things that he made me feel like. I mean, it was like I'd go to a wrestling match in, my dad, you know, when I'm wrestling or whatever I was doing, he would support me. My dad was a bigger man, and he would wake me up, guys, and say he'd get in the truck. He wouldn't run with me, but he'd run, drive the truck beside me, make me get up and say, let's go run four or five miles. And he just always pushed me, always pushed me, always drove me, but always tell me, make me feel that I couldn't lose a match, make me feel like I was stronger than anyone. So had that opportunity. So father and, and you know, uh, and family played a huge part in my success and, and, and also just like role models. Absolutely. And we always get the answers, parents. And I mean, me, I would be the same way growing up. I mean, I played hockey and lacrosse and never did football, but uh, driving me to practice at five in the morning. I mean, and then yeah. having to drive me to school after. And it was crazy. Think about that. They actually did that. Yeah. The sacrifice your parents make for you, right? It's crazy. Yeah. If you could sit uh, what's down. The well, if you could sit down for dinner with anyone famous, dead or alive, who would it be? Yeah, that's a great question. If I could sit down with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Um, man, um, I, I think when I when I think about people that came up in a, in an era where it was so different, one would be Rocky Marciano. Just because I, I think when you think about the Italian race and how times that they were persecuted and like blacks and different things, but just achieving, still keeping your head down, still, you know, still going, still moving. Um, Jack Dempsey, those great old fighters that had to, that they fought for freedom and, you know, seeing some of these guys and who they were and just to, to sit down with a Jack Dempsey and sit down with a, you know, a guy like that and, and to sit down with, you know, with, um, because of the fact Marciano and Dempsey, they both came up and they were in that era was so much different. It's a different world just to see how did, what was some of the things that, that kept you on that track for success? What were some of those things that, you know, didn't make you skew to the left or to the right? Because now we're in a, we're, we're, we live in a world guys and you guys see it that people are afraid to share their feelings. They're afraid to talk about what's right and wrong. And just like they're just because we are in this time and it's scary because our kids and our kids, kids and our future is at stake and we don't want to stand up for what's right anymore. And, it, and it's afraid that you can't have health, healthy debate. I tell my son, I tell my kids, you don't have to you don't have to be red or blue to do what's right. And you see so many times we live in a world right now that you see that if you if you're if you're if you're white, you're white privileged in and, and you, you're they're shaming white. I, I think it's the hypo hypocrisy of what everything that's going on. They're removing all the, you know, the faces of black people in, in, in stores because they feel that so many things. Why wipe away history? Certain things. You know, I see people tearing down statues. Guess what? And there's a book in Corinthians. It said, if my people, which are called by my name, if they would humble themselves and pray, then would I heal. Then would they hear from heaven and I would heal their land and forgive their sins. But see, too many people, they're thinking about the, they're looking at, they're looking at the tree, the fruit, when it's deeper and it's the root. You can tear yeah. down all the statues you want. You can do all that. That's not going to change the heart. 
We need to educate. We need to help. And so that's why I would want to go back and talk to these people, these guys, because in spite of the obstacles that they had to overcome, overachieve, look where they look where they got. And I think now we're in a place that I, I look at it and, and it's and it's disheartening because we can't have healthy conversation. Without one side, someone's going to call someone, oh, he's being racist. We can't have a healthy conversation when we see so many things that are being used and they're using in the name of Black Lives Matter or certain things that are happening. And we see it and it's like right in front of our face. But we, you know, instead of just having a healthy conversation, say, let's discuss this. Let's discuss issues. Let's talk about, you know, what is, you know, our sisters of the Confederacy? What did they do and how they went out and gathered money and built these statues? We don't history. Let's talk about Tulsa, Oklahoma, or was the Black Wall Street where people were thriving. How did they get there? Let's talk about all these things and say, look, how do we find healthy solutions? Because well, the way that we're going by entitlement is not empowerment. Just because people, so I just think that we, we live in a world that we have to be careful and we have to start calling people out. We have to challenge one another to be better. Black, white, green, it doesn't matter. Democrat, Republicans, we all as people has to start doing a better job of communicating and stop being yep. ashamed and stop shaming people. So that's why when you ask me that question, who would I want to sit down with? Those would be some of the people that I would want to sit down because they had it real. They they had so much op opposition and different things to go through, different things to overcome. And I, I sit here and I just when I, I'm looking and I'm hearing the things that are going on. You or two of my brothers, neither one of you or your parents had slaves. Neither you. So it's like so. But it's like so we're, we're going back and we're we're looking at history. And I understand. Yes, it was horrible. But you still have to be able to go and remember the history in order to move forward. So I just look at the world that we live in, guys, and, and, and I'm sorry I'm going so long, but it's just something that's compassionate. It's passionate to me because we do need to make this world a better place, and it's going to take all of us. I agree 100%. Uh, we're, no, I don't want to say we're a little bit better, but we are a little bit better in Canada. But uh, down there, it's, uh, it's definitely a lot worse. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, uh, I don't but, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why, but it is. <laughs> so, Mike, in, in, uh, go ahead, guys. Okay. If you had a dream venue to play in, uh, what was it? Ben, did you get to play in it? Uh, you know what? I'm going to tell you guys. I know they got, I played in Seattle, the new st the stadium. I, I played in there when it first opened up. But I'm going to tell you a stadium that, People don't give enough respect to, and you got to, if you ever have a chance to go to a game there and play in it, and especially when the team's good, Kansas City, that place was unbelievable. When they do the Star Spangled Banner, and then, you know, at the end, when it's supposed to be in the home of the Brave, and they do in the home of the Chiefs, and that place just rocks, it was <laughs> unbelievable. So that was a, a great place. I love playing it, you know, at, you know, at the Steelers. I love playing against the Pittsburgh Steelers, that place, you know. Uh, you know, uh, Heinz Field, love that place, um, without a doubt. So there's been some great places and great stadiums that I got to, you know, play in and got to you know, witness and experience. Here's a throwback question. Uh, Take me back to your first NFL touchdown, and do you still have the ball? I No, I don't know if I have the ball. Was, was the first one the 73-yard touchdown? I think so, yep. I think I have – I do – you know what? Yes, I still have the ball. Next time we do the show, I'll do it from my sports room and I'll see if I can find that ball. 73 yards against the Atlanta Falcons, second play from first play from scrimmage. I took it to the house. That's right. Take it to the house. I was yeah. out, out, out of there. So what, would, <laughs> what would you say is your favorite piece of memorabilia over on that? You know what? My favorite piece of memorabilia uh, that I have maybe is Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier gloves. And it's on it's got it signed. I got the letter. With it, I have Frazier and Ali. I met them both when they were alive. So that was awesome. Oh, that is sweet. That's my answer to the who would you sit down for dinner with is Muhammad Ali always. I'd love to pick that guy's brain. Yeah, no, he was he was definitely a pioneer. I'd love to sit down with that guy as well. Yeah. And my answer to that is always Seth Rogen or Tupac. There you go, baby. Tupac, baby. Yeah. Um, you bounced around a bit after the Saints uh, to the Jets, Bucks, Titans, and then you found your home with the Bengals. Uh, I feel like that was your first, like, uh, how do I say it? Like, you're, you're kind of pushed to uh, stardom. 
started in the, with the Bengals. Believe it or not, it, it really did. Playing with the Saints, being in New Orleans and looking at that and, and being there and didn't have success, but I got to meet some great men. Ricky Jackson, you know, Sam Mills, Von Johnson, Jim Moore was an awesome coach. So I got to play with a lot of great guys and a lot of great men. And then with the Jets, being able to play for Bill Parcells. And then, you know, in Tampa Bay, it was only a year, but to play with Mike Allstott and I'll be out there going to Tampa to go to his golf tournament, have a hang out with him. He's a great guy, great friend, work done. That one year just really was so, so fun, though. We, we beat Minnesota. If you look at it, they went. Uh, they went 15 and two. We were the first team that beat them. Mike also went for like 140 yards. We had over 200 yards. We just lined up and we just, we had that backfield and it was called Rhino with me and Mike in the backfield. It was called Rhino backfield with me and work done. It was called Pony backfield. So uh, that year was very, very unique. It was very, very fun. We were one game from the playoffs. We were, uh, needed a team to lose to get in. Detroit needed to lose to get in, but didn't get in, but that was an awesome year. And then, the Bengals, like you said, Cincinnati uh, playing there in the dirty natty, man, was great. I didn't like those Coney dogs. I don't know what everyone talks about those Coney dogs. You, you all know, I, I was like, I, I'm not a fan. But I tell you, it, it was a great place. Um, and it was just that place where I wanted to win, wanted to bring change, had great guys there. Corey Dillon being able to block for him, he's an unbelievable runner. Um, we didn't win a lot there. But as a first Pro Bowl, I made it to the Pro Bowl as a Bengal. Uh, just the heart and determination that I had you know, playing there, um, it was just uh, um, unbelievable because I got the taste of winning because prior to there, I was in, I was with the Titans for two years. So we had two years of beating Cincinnati and two years of being a dominant team, getting to the Super Bowl, being an AFC championship. Um, so it was great. And then going to Cincinnati, it was a totally different four hours away, a totally different experience, a totally different feel, but, uh, we still was able to beat the Titans. And that's uh, Dylan. That was Dylan's uh, career year as well. And then uh, you did that back with the Chargers again. You, uh, you and LT together. I mean, uh, for me, Tomlinson's one of the best running backs I've ever seen in my lifetime. And uh, you, you two together, just unbelievable. And uh, three Pro Bowls together. I mean, what was it like playing with like that guy? Oh, he's lightning in a bottle. I used to tell people, if you see the back of 2-1, it's too late. If he's even, he's leaving. I mean, he was just uh, unbelievable, like you said. He could cut on a dime and leave 10 cents change. Unbelievable runner, unbelievable player. You never saw him get hit. Have you ever seen LaDainian Thomason get a big hit? Anybody ever just kill him or blast him? He was so elusive. The guy would break your ankles. Unbelievable runner, unbelievable catcher, uh, pass receiver. And think about it, guys. He was a better person than he is football player. So absolutely love playing with him. Love the experience there in Cincinnati. I mean, uh, in San Diego. Yeah, he was always he was always my boy. I always had Chargers jerseys back in the day. Always the baby blues. I love that jersey. I remember the chunky soup commercials. Yeah. Yes. 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 Absolutely, guys. How could you not? And then he had his little dance. You guys got to look at look up his video where he's doing the uh, the, the 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 electric slide where he's in the Charger uniform where he's in his white tux. It's an unbelievable classic. So if you ever get a chance to look at it. If you want some <laughs> laughter, you'll get it there. For sure. Okay, and uh, I got, I'm a huge Bengals fan. Uh, so, uh, Ocho Cinco, what's he like, Chad Johnson? What's it like playing with him and uh, being in the locker room with that guy? Yeah, Chad was half crazy and all stupid. I love Chad. He was just a Ch – Chad was a, absolutely – had a heart of gold. Just a guy, just, you know, so emotional. But what a hell of a player that he was. Uh, I played with him and TJ Husmanzada. Uh, two guys that both came in, you know, together, uh, really, really became a, a, a staple in Cincinnati together. Those two um, lit it up. And uh, Chad, would like playing with Chad, Chad was just crazy, funny, always smiling, always laughing. Uh, just an amazing, amazing, amazing talent. Uh, what are you up to these days? You know what? Well, these days uh, I work a little bit with 95.7 The Game, do some radio in the Bay part-time. I was doing it full-time, did that for five years. And now just kind of doing some real estate, some multifamily homes, developing some different things. So uh, it's a lot of fun doing that. And, and it's, been, it's, been, it's, been, it's been great. Uh, work, I work uh, in, in the Bay also for the Niners and Raiders, to, uh, do some TV and stuff there. I'm out here now. You can see this great place. I'm in Palm Desert. I'm over visiting my buddy. Richard Dick, his name is Richard Phillips. So uh, I'm on a course 
backyard here, just taking it all in and uh, uh, going to go hang out and grab some dinner, man. So just enjoying life, man, really enjoying life, um, staying busy. Um, uh, the more I could do, get involved in a lot of nonprofit stuff. But like I said, doing real estate, working, um, doing have several different uh, jobs, working with several different companies. So um, really, really enjoy. Actually, there's a company you guys got to check out. It's a, you got to tell your listeners to go buy a street strider. It's a elliptical machine. You could actually ride it out outdoors and stuff. So, uh, involved in that, getting more involved in that. So just having a great time guys and involved in a lot of amazing things. You ever been to okay. Vancouver? What's that? Have you ever been to Vancouver? I, you know what? I come out, I'm coming out there. I'll be out there. I got to call big Moj. you know, Moj. he does yeah. that radio you gotta show. You got to do the shootout, the Moj shootout. Yeah, golf yeah, I'm going to do it. So I'm yeah, you tell him Moj. that me and you did the show. You tell him, Hey, Lo wants to come out. So make sure you, uh, and I'll come out and we'll all hang out guys. Let's do it. Yeah. We had Let's Moj on the show. It was like our very first day. So we were like champagne popping and getting it a little drunk. Yeah. And yeah, that was, the, we had Moj on that day the very first time, but He's a, he's a good guy. He's a hoot. He's a lot of fun. I'll tell you, he'll put he'll put them back. So yeah. So let's plan on that. Once you got, I'll make sure I hit him up too. And guys, let's do it again. Maybe the next time we'll wait till my son hopefully get drafted, and then uh maybe the father and son will come on and we'll uh come on the show again and, and do it again. Yeah. We'd love to have him on before yeah. the draft even. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll hit him up and let him know. You yeah. guys think about it and let him know. See what he thinks. Okay. Yeah, we would love that. We'd love to promote him before the draft. That would be sweet and. Uh, uh, another thing, man, you are the best fullback of all time. And I don't know how you're not in the hall of fame, but it's coming. It's coming. Man. I just, you know what? I just, for me, I just appreciate, you know, like thought guys like you to just that mention it. I appreciate just the thoughts that people, you know, being on the, making it to the top 50 and, you know, top hundred, just being on the list. And that, you know, that that's, it's, it, it's, it's an honor just to be on that list. I really appreciate all the support and I, I thank you so much for the kind words, but, um, you know, if it happens, it, if it happens, it happens, but, I'm just honored to be on the list, honored to be around guys like yourself and, you know, you two great gentlemen that bring me on your show and, you know, a bunch of kind words and, and that give me an opportunity just sometimes to express yourself about life too, because football is, football is, you know, it's a, we were, I'm a, I was a grown man playing a kid's game, getting the King's ransom. Um, but football is a game. Football is what I did. It's not who I am. Yeah. And I'm glad that we have the opportunity to, you know, to be able to, you know, to, to be able to talk, not just sports, but be able to talk about life, be able to talk about issues that are really that, that are, that are pressing this great world that we live in, this pressing this great country that we live in. So I'm excited about having the platform too, guys. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your thoughts and uh, God bless us all. And God bless this wonderful uh, country we're in. If you're looking for a mug, perhaps a hoodie. Head on over to I only touch greatness.com. Looking for the most beers on tap? Great steaks, great staff. Head over to the John B. Pub. We got the best beers, steaks, chicken wings, nachos in town. Come see us at the John B. Pub. The John B. Pub, the best bar in town. Come sign up for our football pool. Say hey, sent you.